broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us as we kick off the 2022 NACOL webinar series. As part of our effort to support the oversight community, we developed our webinar series where we bring you information on the practice of civilian oversight, innovations in the field, and important work being done in the area of criminal justice reform. I'm particularly excited that you've joined us today as we welcome Dr. Lori Friedel back to discuss implicit bias, training of law enforcement, what we know about its effectiveness and such of such training, and the common myths that surround it. Before I turn things over, I'd like to remind all of you that you have entered today's session in listen-only mode. During the webinar, you will have the ability to type in any questions you might have. Those questions will then be posted to to our speaker today following their presentation. I'd like to also remind you that today's meeting is being recorded and will be made available on the NACOL website at a later date. With that, I'll hand it now over to Lieutenant Sean Hill of the Santa Barbara Police Department. Sean is a member of NACOL's Training, Education and Standards Committee and has developed today's webinar for us. I think it's important to note that Sean has co-edited international model policy for policing through his work with the IACP. He's written curricula for courses in which police officers and college students work collaboratively through critical thinking exercises, and has examined the intersection of community policing and intergroup contact and accommodation theories, as well as organizational resilience. I tell you all of that to also emphasize how lucky we are to have Lieutenant Hill as part of our committees. He also currently works in the Chief's Office at the Santa Barbara Police Department, where he oversees the development, implementation, and evaluation of department processes and initiatives related to police accountability. In addition, he is currently serving as liaison to the Community Formation Commission in Santa Barbara, a group working to develop recommendations for effective and sustainable civilian oversight for the city's police department. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Sean. Josh, thank you, uh, and good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, and I appreciate the introduction, but this is not about me today. This is about uh, Dr. Lori Fidel, who I'm super excited and honored to have here with us today. Um, Dr. Fidel is a professor of criminology at the University of South Florida. Uh, she's also the former director of the Peace Officers Research Forum, PERF, um, and she's a national expert uh, at bias policing and, and has written and published extensively um, you know, for years uh, in the field. She has developed uh, the Fair and Impartial Policing Training Program, which provides training for law enforcement officers. And as a result, she's trained officers all over North America. And for me personally, which is really important, um, I do work in the areas of communication and policing uh, in translational criminology. And Dr. Fridell's work has been incredibly impactful for me and informative for me um, in looking at those uh, intergroup communication um, issues between police and the public. And, and when I say that, I mean, oftentimes it's referred to us versus them or the we, they bias. Um, and uh, these these uh, these processes can really produce harmful outcomes such as stereotypes. So, so Dr. Friedel uh, will probably go into all that. Uh, and with that, I, I have to say that I'm honored to um, introduce uh, Dr. Friedel. Very good. Well, thank you, Cami, and thank you to Lieutenant Hill. And Cami, is the screen on the left showing my controls? Should I get rid of those? Can't see those. You can go ahead and start sharing your screen. There we go. Okay, very good. All right. Well, again, thank you, Cami. Thank you, Lieutenant Hill. And I'm very honored to be here. I certainly have the greatest respect for NACOL and all the work that is done by those of you that are involved in police oversight. But I also understand we've got a lot of law enforcement and other criminal justice uh, officials on the phone, and I'm hoping that this presentation speaks equally to all of you. And in thinking about the presentation, which is not advancing, I thought of an agenda that I think will be very relevant to everyone that has joined us. One, I do want to start with a brief overview of the science of bias. And I'm assuming that many of you on the phone, maybe most of you are somewhat familiar with implicit bias, but I will provide kind of a, a review, if you will. And then importantly for this audience, what are the characteristics of high quality implicit bias training? And you'll see me use IBT in some of my slides. <clears throat> 
Also, fact and fiction, both about implicit bias and implicit bias training. And this comes from um, the summer of 2020, lots of discussions about police reform, um, some discussions about implicit bias training, some of it fact and some of it fiction. So I'll help you uh, make your way through the difference. And in that context, I will also talk about what the research shows in terms of the effectiveness of implicit bias training. And then also very relevant, I think, to this audience is what is it that law enforcement leaders need to do besides providing implicit bias training to their line personnel in order to produce fair and impartial agencies? And then we have left plenty of time for comments and questions. So starting with the science, um, as many of you know, there's a difference between explicit and implicit bias. Explicit bias is generally what people think about when they think about bias and prejudice. And with explicit bias, the person categorizes individuals, maybe it's based on race or gender, income, immigration status. They categorize individuals and then they link those groups, those individuals, to stereotypes associated with those groups. The linkage between the groups and the stereotypes is based on animus and hostility towards those groups. So they're negative stereotypes. And those stereotypes in that person's head can impact not just on perceptions, but on behavior, producing discriminatory behavior. Now, with explicit bias, these biases are conscious. The person is aware of them and might even tell you about them. And they're either unconcerned about the discriminatory behavior or it's intentional. Now, implicit bias shares some characteristics with explicit bias. With implicit bias, we still categorize individuals and link them to stereotypes, but it's not necessarily based on animus and hostility. These implicit associations, these stereotypes in our head can impact on our perceptions and our behavior, producing discriminatory behavior. But these thoughts are automatic and the behavior can be produced even in well-intentioned people who on the conscious level reject biases, stereotypes, and prejudice. So ways we can categorize people, race and ethnicity, SES, English language abilities, gender, age, mental health status, religious affiliation, profession, sexual orientation, body shape, attractiveness, dress, and of course the list goes on and on. And then we might link those groups to positive, negative, or neutral stereotypes. People in that group are smart, lazy, bad drivers, motivated, criminal, wealthy. So as examples, many people link attractive people to competence, people of color to crime and threat, non-English speakers to lack of intelligence. Now, relevant to this audience, what might implicit associations look like in a police officer? Maybe that officer is undervigilant with certain groups, undervigilant with whites, with Asians, women, or the elderly. And of course, the converse of that would be overvigilant, overvigilant with, with teens, with people of color, with men. An officer with implicit associations might interpret ambiguous behavior on the part of blacks and Hispanics as more threatening. We've got a two car crash, we've got two different stories, Maybe the officer believes the man in the BMW in a tie over the young kid in the 1995 Toyota Corolla. So I wanna talk about some key characteristics of implicit associations. I mentioned some of these above in defining what it is. Implicit associations are automatic, meaning they just pop into our head. Some of you might be familiar with Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking fast and slow, we think two ways. Our slow thinking is when we have to ponder and focus. So if I asked all of you to multiply four times 14, I expect all of you could do that, but most of us would need to engage and focus and concentrate. In contrast, our fast thinking are the thoughts that just pop into our head, and that includes implicit associations. As I mentioned, these implicit associations can manifest outside of our conscious awareness and nonetheless impact perceptions and behaviors. 
So another characteristic of implicit associations, they may be incompatible with our conscious attitude. I used to think before I learned about the science of implicit bias, because of my progressive attitudes, I must be bias free. Of course, I was wrong. But my implicit biases may not match my conscious attitude. So for instance, I mentioned before that many people have the implicit association between people of color and crime, aggression, and threat. And I have the, for people of color, slash crime, aggression, threat, implicit bias. That's not compatible, however, with my conscious beliefs. And in fact, you know, we gotta be careful about being too complacent about how progressive we are, and therefore that means we have no biases. There's some research that shows the more unbiased a person thinks she is, the more biased her behavior. We're working through the characteristics of implicit associations. They may be incompatible with your conscious attitudes, and they are more likely when we are facing ambiguous information, ambiguous stimuli. And that can take various forms. So for instance, ambiguous people. Ambiguous people are people we don't know. And when we talk about categorizing people that we meet and linking them to stereotypes, we do that with people we don't know. They come to us as a blank slate and we are inclined to fill them in. So we categorize them maybe based on gender, disability, LGBTQ, socioeconomic status, and link them to the characteristics that we've come to accumulate over time regarding that group. You don't do that. You don't do that with people you know, because those people come to you already filled in and you don't fill them in with stereotypes when you see them. You know, and even though we're talking about the science of implicit bias, what you're recognizing are some common concepts, judging a book by its cover, the power of first impressions. I mean, I use this science when I walk into a classroom at the beginning of the semester. I know that as soon as I walk in that first day, they're gonna judge me, the students are gonna judge me. So what am I gonna do? Work it, work it, you know, off white blouse, dark suit, three inch heels, because I want them to look at me and think professional, smart, and knows what she's talking about. Another way to think about ambiguity is ambiguous situations or ambiguous information. So for instance, the street cop, the ambiguity might be the furtive movement. For a detective, maybe there are two different independent people who might have committed the crime, but the detective processes some of that evidence through the lens of her implicit associations and who she thinks might be more likely to commit crime. Biases, of course, can manifest inside the agency with managerial decisions. So for police supervisors and managers, maybe it's deciding whom to promote. Because anytime we're involving judgments of human beings, every time it's a subjective analysis, this is an opportunity for our biases to impact. Characteristics of implicit association may be incompatible with conscious attitudes. They are more likely to impact us when we're facing ambiguity. They can be linked to your own group. Now, I'm gonna share, I've already given you one confession that I have the black hyphen crime implicit association. Here's my second confession. Um, I work at the University of South Florida and um, because I'm in the over 60 group, I frequently have um, IT troubles and I call the USFIT hotline. So a couple months ago, I called the IT hotline to get help with a computer issue. The phone was answered by a woman. The automatic thought that popped into my head, oh dear, well, a woman will be able to help me. All right, don't judge me, don't judge me. So that actually makes the point though, that I can have some negative stereotypes about my own group. This phone call actually gets worse, so let me continue. Um, about halfway through the call, I thought, well, wait a minute, this woman might be Asian. And the automatic thought that popped into my head, again, forgive me, Never mind. I'm in good hands after all. All right. So, okay. So this is not great that I have these biases, but I am going to come back to this particular experience because what was so important or the good thing about this experience is I recognized those automatic thoughts immediately. 
And if we're going to manage our biases, we have to start by recognizing when these automatic thoughts pop into our head. Characteristics of implicit associations may be incompatible with conscious attitudes, more likely when we're facing ambiguity, can be linked to your own group, can be based in part on fact. Um, an academic example. So for instance, academics might have implicit associations linking students of certain races and or low socioeconomic status to their educational capabilities. Well, in fact, because of unequal educational opportunities in our society, demographic groups do come to us differentially prepared. So those stereotypes might be based in part on fact. Another one I've mentioned several times, the black hyphen crime implicit association or people of color hyphen aggressiveness implicit association. Many of us link people of color to crime and aggressiveness. Well, I come to you as a criminologist and I can tell you that criminological research has shown people of color are disproportionately represented amongst people involved in street crime. Now, let me say a couple of things because I know I've got an educated group here. First of all, the criminologists who are looking for this link between demographics and who commit crime, of course they can't use official statistics. They can't look at arrests, prosecutions, um, incarceration, because those statistics could be inextricably linked to biases in our system. So they have to use other means to do that other than official statistics. And then the other thing, of course, is that when we look further into this correlation, um, we find, you know, it's not that it's race as a causal factor that produces crime. This relationship, again, is linked to lack of opportunities, discrimination, unequal education and opportunities. That's what produces the relationship. But the key, the key here is that some of our stereotypes can be based in part on fact. However, this is the big however in our training. Even though our implicit associations can be based in part on fact, that does not justify treating an individual as if they fit the stereotype. Such decisions, such actions on the part of police can make them ineffective, unsafe, as well as unjust. Now, we've been developing um, in the Fair and Impartial Policing Training Program, which is our traditional audience has always been law enforcement. We've developing some additional programs, including one for emergency medical services. And I had the opportunity to write an article with an EMT in emergency medical services world um, in August. And I was making this point, and I think it really brings home the message about the downside of treating an individual as if they fit the stereotype. And what we wrote is this, a stereotype is not necessarily untrue, quite the opposite. An EMT might associate homeless people with drug use and miss the real medical issue because that reflects her 15 years of experience on the job. She might associate arrestees with handcuff allergy, which is why the EMT was called to the scene and miss the medical issue because that has been the reality nine times out of 10. We wrote, indeed, we can acknowledge that many of our implicit associations are based in part on fact. The danger, however, is treating the individual that patient in front of you, as if she fits the stereotype. In fact, that may very well be the one in 10 that needs your diligent care. So stereotypes can be based in part on fact. We do not treat the individual as if they fit the stereotype. So again, implicit associations, various characteristics, they are automatic. They can manifest outside conscious awareness. Nonetheless, they can impact not just our perceptions, but our behavior, producing discriminatory behavior. They may be incompatible with our conscious attitudes and beliefs. They are more likely when we are facing ambiguity. They can be linked to our own group, and they can be based in part on fact. Now, for this particular audience, I think it's important to talk about the characteristics of high quality implicit bias training. I know we have individuals that are NACOL members and involved in civilian oversight advising agencies, and I know we have law enforcement representatives. Now, in discussing the characteristics of high quality implicit bias training, let's put on the table my conflict of interest, 
because of course I have a training program, fair and impartial policing. So you're gonna think, well, gosh, look how the characteristics of high quality implicit bias training match her program. All right, let's put that on the table. I have a conflict of interest. However, in my defense, you know, our training program is based on two bodies of science. One is the science of implicit bias, certainly in terms of its content, but also in terms of the science for how it is we motivate individuals to implement debiasing techniques. And then the other body of science has to do with adult learning and how do we engage in adult learning, produce motivation for them to do what we want them to do. And so those are, and you'll see that these characteristics are linked to those two bodies of science. So characteristics, high quality implicit bias training for law enforcement. First and foremost, it has to reduce the defensiveness that many law enforcement officers bring into a training on bias. Now, probably many groups, and indeed many groups, bring this type of defensiveness, but it can be heightened for law enforcement, and it's very understandable. I mean, this group, more than any other group in our society, has been hit over the head as biased for decades. And it has been, these criticisms have come through the lens of explicit bias, so that they've been castigated as all racist, they've been castigated as universally having animus and hostility towards uh, marginal groups, and so it is not surprising that many law enforcement officers come into our training somewhere between defensive and sometimes outright hostile. And we are not gonna get through, we are not gonna make the sale, we are not gonna get them to implement de-biasing techniques unless we reduce that defensiveness. So a training needs to be focused on the science. When we walk in, we say, we're not here to talk to you about the science of police bias. We're here to talk about the science of human bias but how it might make you ineffective, unsafe, and unjust. So no finger pointing, no blaming, and you have to have credible trainers. I expect there might be some people in the audience that think it's really important to have community members involved in this training, and I can certainly see a role, for instance, maybe a credible community member sharing what it's like to be on the receiving end of bias policing. But in order to reduce the defensiveness and make the sale, credible trainers. Now in our own program, that means sworn law enforcement. So that that person in the room listening to a topic that has uh, raised the hair on the back of his neck for many years is hearing it from a person who does his job. Not generic, but rather customized. I mean, there's lots of generic programs out there. You can find a, a person that will train retail and law enforcement and fire and give them all the same training um, and adult learning principals would say, no, the training needs to be customized. For our own in our law enforcement curriculum, that means different trainings for line, first line supervisors, executives, and civilian. And then also we've um, expanded our curriculum to other groups by popular demand, and you have to have different versions for corrections, fire, EMS, city workers, and prosecutors. Adult learners need to be able to relate the material to their own world, and that means examples, science, scenarios that reflect their day-to-day -day work. Training must be engaging and interactive for adult learners. We feel very strongly, particularly for law enforcement, because of the you know, baggage on this issue that they, they bring into a training, classroom training. We've had a lot of pressure over the years to do virtual and to online. Um, I think particularly for basic training, the first exposure, having the trainees in the room, again, with a law enforcement trainer grappling with this issue is the most effective. Um, we, we max the uh, audience at 30, put them at tables formed into a U to maximize interaction and involvement. Certainly the training needs to cover biases more than just race and ethnicity. And then covering various types of bias that might manifest in law enforcement, not just implicit associations, but attention bias, confirmation bias, outgroup bias. And indeed, we, we added outgroup bias in our last um, revamp in 2019. And, and outgroup bias recognizes that we all have our we and everybody else is our they. Um, we see more positive characteristics in our we or more comfortable with our we. And when you think about policing and you think about the continuum, here's our we and here's our they, if you go all the way down the they end of the continuum, 
you reach dehumanization. And I have had a lot of interesting discussions with police leaders um, over the years, last few years about dehumanization, asking them this question, do you think the policing profession, just the nature of the profession, could lead some officers to dehumanize certain groups? And I've never had a person say no, never had a person. So we need to acknowledge this. We need to prevent this. We need to support the officers so that this does not happen. Um, when I saw Officer Chauvin, I wasn't really, it wasn't really implicit associations popping into my head. It was dehumanization. Talking about the characteristics of high quality implicit bias training for law enforcement, it includes skills appropriate for each subgroup. So, for instance, our skills for patrol officers, recognize your biases. And again, that was important that coming out of my um, USFIT phone call. Over the years, because I have focused so hard, I start to recognize those automatic thoughts. Reduce your biases. And I'll return to this um, issue. It's very hard, actually, to reduce our biases, and we're never going to eliminate them. But there are various mechanisms supported by the science that can help us over the long term read our biases. One of them that's intuitive to you, it's the contact theory. The more we have positive contact with people who are different from us, that reduces both explicit and implicit. It makes sense to you. Manage your bias. Again, USF hotline. I have to recognize my implicit bias. And if I'm motivated, I can choose to implement bias-free behavior. This is huge. Um, in our patrol class, we also talk about beware the biases of others. And that breaks down into two subtopics. One, beware of the biases of your colleagues. And we do some scenarios. What are you gonna do if you suspect bias on the part of your colleague? But then also, what about bias on the part of community members? And we coined the phrase profiling by proxy. And this is when community members call the police based on their own biases. You've heard of it, babysitting while Muslim, barbecuing while black. This type of call puts the police in a particularly difficult situation. So we talk about profiling by proxy and, and what officers need to do. Another skill, if feasible, slow it down. And this is a mainstay of police training, but we make better decisions when we slow things down, when we can collect more information that allows us to uh, get more information and reduce ambiguity and manage our biases. And then of course, know your agency's bias policing policy. The skills that we share with supervisors, all of the above that the patrol officers got, but they also need to know how to supervise to promote fair and impartial policing. And this breaks down into learning how to identify when subordinates may be behaving in a biased manner and when and how to intervene when you suspect it. Now the FIP skills, quote unquote, for leaders, I'm gonna talk about that below. We call it the comprehensive program to produce fair and impartial policing. So I have that coming up. Um, we're still talking about the characteristics of high quality implicit bias training. You have to produce the motivation in the trainees to use skills. I mentioned the three elements before of managing biases. If we recognize our implicit associations and we're motivated, we can choose to implement bias free behavior. So motivation is key and it's number two. So how do you produce motivation in um, law enforcement? Well, we certainly talk about the consequences of biased behavior for the victim, the community member on the receiving end, the agency and the community, but you also got to hit it right home to the officer. What are the consequences to this officer? And our mantra is, and I've said it before, policing based on your biases and stereotypes are going to make you ineffective, unsafe, as well as unjust. Another characteristic has resources for follow up training, whatever program you're using, because a lot of people on the phone, maybe you've already implemented implicit bias training in your own agency. Have you implemented the follow up 12, 18 months later, any important law enforcement training needs to be boosted, needs to be reinforced. And you don't want to share just the exact same material. It's got to be something that's, that's got the same principles, but in a new and fresh 
So I want to turn to fact and fiction. And again, this does come from the summer of 2020 um, with lots of discussions about implicit bias training as well as other types of reforms. And some of it was truth and some of it was fiction. And I want to uh, help you parse your way through the two. So first of all, one fiction that you hear, the science supporting the existence of implicit bias is not strong, meaning the base science about implicit bias is not strong. Um, that's not true. Um, there are decades of science supporting the existence of bias. There is general consensus across the social psychology world that implicit biases exist. Now, there are debates within the science. For instance, when and how does implicit bias impact behavior? Critically important question. Um, which skills, which debiasing skills are the most effective? Again, very important. Now, for those who suggest that the science is weak, generally what they do is they point to the issues of reliability and validity surrounding the Harvard Implicit Association Test or Harvard IAT. And probably many of you have heard of it. If you haven't, Google Harvard IAT and you can take a quick and dirty test of your own implicit bias. Well, in fact, there are legitimate questions about the reliability and the validity of the IAT. That is true. The problem is that's just only one measure. It's just the most accessible. It's the most well-known. It's meant to be quick and dirty. That's one of many measures of implicit bias. And the IAT could fall to the wayside tomorrow and it would not impact, affect the volume of science that shows the existence of implicit bias. Another fiction, the objective of implicit bias training is to eliminate bias. And this is how this shows up in the um, media. There's an article on implicit bias training and the journalist writes, there's no scientific evidence indicating that this training could ever work. And then they interview the scientists who say it's near impossible to eliminate biases. Actually, that's true. And I mentioned that before. It is very difficult to reduce our biases we're not going to eliminate our biases. But the problem here with this quote unquote journalism is that it's not the goal of implicit bias training to eliminate bias. Now, yes, FIP, fair and impartial policing, we do share some bias reducing skills. I mentioned the contact theory. The more we interact with people we don't know, that can reduce our biases. But mostly a science-based training is gonna be about awareness and bias management not reduction and certainly not elimination. Another fiction, implicit bias produces a backlash in trainees. So again, the claim is that the implicit bias training makes racist attitudes or biased behavior even worse. Now, this particularly fiction is based on some science. There are some researchers who in the laboratory directed their research subjects to repress their biases. P -p Pretend they're not there, you know, make them go away. Repress your biases. And in fact, in those laboratory studies, racist attitudes and discriminatory behavior increased. But here's the rub. Any science-based implicit bias training does not direct the individuals to repress their biases. Instead, it's the opposite. Become aware of your biases. So again, it's based on science, but it produces a fiction regarding implicit bias training. Another fiction, implicit bias training normalizes bias. And actually this is a little bit nuanced because there's some fact here. Implicit bias training tells people bias is normal is the criticism. In fact, yes, it does. And bias is normal. Because I mentioned what we're doing when we are manifesting our implicit associations is we're categorizing people and linking them to the information we've accumulated over time 
regarding that group. We do that every minute of every day. You do that with doors, you do that with cars, you look at a door you've never seen before, you categorize it as a door, and you call upon information you've accumulated over time so you know how to open it. So this is how our mind works. Our mind categorizes things and then calls upon information we've accumulated. So yes, bias is normal. What is not normalized in implicit bias training? Biased behavior, biased behavior. Fiction, there is no evidence that implicit bias training is effective. Indeed, that is a fiction. Now, in talking about the research, I'm gonna make some distinctions. And one of the distinctions um, is between some of the research that has looked at implicit bias training generally, meaning on various audiences, not necessarily law enforcement, not necessarily criminal justice. And then I'll contrast that to a single experimental study evaluating implicit bias training given to police. Another distinction is when we look at the results and the outcomes that are produced, I'll distinguish between the impact on knowledge, attitudes, and intentions versus impact on behavior, and all of that is important. So starting with the general research, meaning various groups uh, receiving implicit bias training, and looking at knowledge, attitudes, and intentions. We have found in experimental studies, a number of them, that implicit bias trainees versus the control group, and this is in random assignment, the implicit bias trainees after are more aware of their biases, more concerned about discrimination, they have increased motivation to behave in a bias-free manner and indicate intention to use bias-reducing and bias-managing skills. Now, if we look at the general training, various audiences, and what we found in terms of the impact of implicit bias training on behavior, again, when they look at the trained group versus the control group, they find that implicit bias training reduces biased behavior. As just one example, a study randomly assigned university science departments to receive implicit bias training or not receive implicit bias training, and they followed them over time. The departments with the training hired significantly more women and minorities. So the general literature does show that it impacts behavior. Now there's been one experimental study of implicit bias training for law enforcement. And this was conducted when fair and impartial policing um, provided the training to all 36,000 NYPD sworn personnel. Um, and in terms of knowledge, attitudes, and intentions, they found that the officers who were trained in implicit bias were more likely to recognize bias policing as a legitimate public concern more concerned about discrimination as a social problem, more motivated to act in an unbiased way, including committed to using the FIP skills, and also more likely to recognize how implicit bias can impact police professionals. Now, the researchers did attempt to identify the behavior changes in the field that could be linked directly to the fair and impartial police training, and they did not detect that link. And in describing their results, the null results, they said this could mean one of two things. It could mean that FIP did not impact on behavior, but they also said it could be that the research did not detect behavior changes. And with regard to the latter, the researchers wrote this, estimating the effect of a single training curriculum on officers' decisions may well be akin to finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. And they went on to say that this search for this needle in the haystack is even more challenging when an agency is undergoing multiple interventions at the same time, which was the case in New York. Our training, this evaluation, were on the heels of the stop and frisk controversy and lawsuits. There were a number of interventions put in place, some of them well in advance of our training, all dedicated to reducing disparity in law enforcement. That makes it very hard to identify the additional impact of FIP. Additionally, we expect training such as this, implicit bias training, to affect the decisions and actions where officers have the most discretion. And this links to the ambiguity concept. 
it's not going to impact decisions where they have little or no discretion. And the researchers were not able to isolate those decisions and actions on which we would expect to have the most impact. And so, in light of this, why do I still believe that implicit bias um, training for police works? First of all, I understand the constraints of social scientists. I am one. Um, the other confirmed and documented outcomes reflect what I would call precursors to behavior change. More likely to recognize bias policing as a concern, more concerned about discrimination as a social problem, more motivated to act. All of those are the important precursors to behavior change. And then also, I do listen to our constituency. Some of the comments, and in fact, even though many um, individuals come into implicit bias training, as I said, somewhere between defensive and hostile, um, it gets rave reviews. The, the modal response is five out of five. And here are some of the comments that tell me that we're having an impact. This training was one of the best trainings I've attended. It was an eye-opening experience that has made me a better police officer. The strengths of the course is realizing that we all have internal bias and just knowing how to control and manage it while on duty is key. It helped me understand that everyone has biases, including myself. I cannot allow those biases to determine my performance at work or outside it. It was an informative lesson, no BS, actually made me rethink how I would handle situations I've performed in the past. And my all-time favorite, this training made me a better officer and a better person. So even though trainee satisfaction surveys aren't the same as an experimental evaluation, they do matter, particularly on this topic and with law enforcement, because when you get responses like this, you know you've overcome the defensiveness and imparted motivation to implement behavior change. So I want to turn next to what law enforcement leaders need to do to promote fair and impartial policing. And here are some of the assumptions of command level training. One, leaders need to do more than just learn about their own biases and how to manage them. You know, if that were the case, we could just give them the patrol training and be done with it. Also, they need to do more than just provide implicit bias training to their personnel for a couple of reasons. One, implicit bias training is geared towards the individuals who have good intentions and want to serve their communities. We know that there are also people with explicit bias. We have racists in all professions. We have it in policing. Implicit bias training is not going to take a racist and turn them into a non-racist. So we got more work to do, even after we've trained the well-intentioned individuals in implicit bias. IBT is not going to effectively reach all the personnel. And then the leaders need to implement policies and practices. This is the bottom line that support and promote impartial policing in these areas. And we call these the elements of a comprehensive strategy to produce fair and impartial policing. And I'll be giving brief overview of each of these, hiring, evaluation, and promotion, policy, training, leadership, supervision, and accountability, measurement, operations, and outreach to diverse communities. So starting with hiring, evaluation, and promotion, we talk about, of course, what departments have been trying to do for many years, sorry we don't bring the silver bullet, but attempts to hire and promote to produce agency diversity that reflects the community that the agency serves. How to hire people who can police in an unbiased fashion, and if that makes your brows furrow, it should. Not an easy thing, but important to think about. And then ensuring that internal decisions are in fact impartial, hiring, promotion, discipline. So talking about managerial biases. Policy is critically important in an agency and virtually every law enforcement agency starting in 1999, 2000, virtually every police department in this country has some version of a bias policing policy. And the most important aspect of this policy is telling the personnel, when is it you can use demographics to make law enforcement decisions and when you can't. And this is so important going hand in hand with implicit bias training, because in the training we're saying sometimes demographics are going to impact you, you know, automatically. You got to follow up and say, and this is when it's okay to use demographics and this is when it's not. And so we present various models 
and talk about the pros and cons of those models. And let me point out at this point, there's a lot of very poor policies out there that don't provide this important guidance to the personnel. I probably review two or three policies a month um, and find lots to fix so that we can make sure that policies across the nation communicate clearly to the well-meaning personnel when you can use demographics, when you cannot. Training, so actually there's, I think of training, I think, and bias, I think of two categories of decisions and two different types of training. So it's rather simplistic, but when I think about policing, one category of decisions is where the officer has a moment to contemplate. Would I be requesting consent to search but for the fact that this person is fill in the line. And then of course we have decisions in law enforcement that are split second. You don't have time to reflect on your biases and manage them. And of course that can be in the context of use of force. So when I think of those two types of categories and I think of bias training, I think of two types of training. For the moment, for the decisions where you have a moment to contemplate, that's implicit bias awareness. For quick second use of force decisions, we need high quality use of force training with the intention being this, take the demographics out of the use of force decision making. Again, demographics being inherent in our human biases. So how do we take those demographics out of those quick moving use of force decisions? And actually based on the science, and um, this is um, consistent with much training around the nation, if you've got the video training and you're putting the officers through it frequently, you make sure that the person in the video who turns out to be a threat is just as likely to be a woman as a man, just as likely to be middle-aged as a teenager, just as likely to be white as black, and this is based on um, implicit bias principles. And if you do that over and over again, you're training your personnel, don't consider demographics, consider other things. And we do have some confirmation in laboratory studies um, of the efficacy of this type of training to take the demographics out of those split-second decisions. Leadership, supervision, and accountability. So in terms of leadership, it's promoting a culture that supports impartial policing, but then also ongoing communications that not only reinforce implicit bias training, but reinforce that fair and impartial policing is a priority of this agency. Supervisors, I mentioned skills before, we need to ensure that supervisors are supervising to promote fair and impartial policing. And then accountability. So every agency has accountability mechanisms in place to um, promote democratic policing, in policy policing, respectful policing. We just have to make sure that those existing accountability mechanisms are also focused on the aspiration of impartial policing. I'll give you an example, reviewing body worn cameras. So all agencies with body worn cameras are going to require a supervisory review if the incident involves force, complaint, and injury. And then many also require random review. And this is how you turn body worn cameras into a, an effective accountability device. You've got supervisors reviewing random um, videos. And generally I find that supervisors are directed in these random reviews to look for in policy behavior, safe behavior, respectful behavior. Well, in terms of fair and impartial policing, we just need to add a bullet for those supervisors. Be a lookout um, for bias and bias-free behavior when you're reviewing videos. That's a way of taking an existing accountability mechanism and focusing it as well on the aspiration of impartial policing. Measurement. All right, so measurement. Um, in the command level training, we talk about the pros, the cons, and the best practices associated with measurement. And by that, and I'm sure everyone on this phone call is familiar, I'm talking about any type of system that identifies the demographics of the people on the receiving end of a police practice. In the early 2000s, vehicle stop data collection. Um, in more recently, certainly use of force and stop and frisk. So these are the, the measurement systems about which I speak. So we need to look at those and recognize what it is they can tell us and what it is they can't. And one of the important messages is disparity 
is not the same as bias. Many community members believe that when you see disparity results, whether it's in stop and frisk use of force, uh, vehicle stops, that that is a measure of bias. And as a social scientist, that has concerned me, and that's why I wrote the book on the right, um, disparity can actually be produced by multiple factors. Certainly, it can be produced by bias, and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing in the world if I didn't think it contributed to disparity in policing. But disparity results can also be produced by legitimate factors. And as a social scientist, I can tell you, it's a piece of cake. It's very easy to measure disparity. It's much more difficult to parse out the factors that produced that disparity. How much of this disparity was produced by legitimate factors and how much is left over, which may indicate bias. So we have to be very um, um, savvy about measurement to make sure that we produce the responsible conclusions. Operations, of course, that's a big area and uh, operations covers a lot of things. Um, what we talk about is implementing policies and practices that support and promote bias-free behavior. The opposite of that is adopting policies and practices that completely undermine it. So if you have just given your agency implicit bias training, and then you tell them to go out and stop and frisk anybody who looks like a criminal, you've completely undermined all of the messages in the training. Um, and then we talk about this in the context of proactive policing, which many on the call know that's state of the art. It can be very effective in reducing crime and disorder, but proactive policing, depending on implementation, can be at risk of unconstitutional policing, whether that's Fourth Amendment, search and seizure, or 14th Amendment, and by that I refer to equal protection. So proactive policing needs to be implemented with safeguards to ensure that it is, in fact, fair and impartial. So that's part of the discussion. And then one thing we're seeing around the nation, I see headlines every week, is there's a big discussion about um, whether and how we might reduce some of the low-level enforcement, uh, enforcement of low-level violations, which produce great disparities um, and can lead to additional issues um, with maybe very little bang for the buck. And we see those headlines every week. So it's, it's worth an agency um, exploring whether that is an option for under the heading of operations. And then outreach to diverse communities. And I don't need to tell anybody here how important it is and, and agencies across the nation are doing this, um, developing relationships with their constituency. First and foremost on every interaction between an officer and a community member, but also with programs to um, increase trust and confidence on the part of the community members for the police. So again, what is it that law enforcement leaders need to do? implement a comprehensive program to produce fair and impartial policing. So where have we been? Well, the science has taught us that we, we thought for many years that there was only one way that bias and prejudice manifested, and that was with explicit biases. Now we know that even well-intentioned officers have biases that can impact perceptions of behavior. So all police should receive high quality implicit bias training, but we're not done there. Law enforcement leaders also need to promote bias-free decisions with the elements of the comprehensive program. And importantly, the bottom line though too is, you know, implicit bias training isn't the do-all end-all. It's not the answer to bias in policing, but I would argue that it is a necessary component of multi-dimensional efforts. All right, and so with that, I turn it back to, I think it's Cami who is going to organize uh, questions and comments. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Friedel. So we do have some questions. Um, I wanna encourage those of you out there who might have questions um, following the presentation to type them in so that we can make sure in the time that we have left to ask as many as possible. Um, so with that, let's start with this. So what, if any, efforts are social scientists making to measure the effectiveness of implicit bias training for law enforcement personnel? You mentioned, mentioned a single study of FIP's training of the NYPD in the aftermath of the stop and frisk settlement. Do you think such efforts to measure the effectiveness of this training is important and why or why not? It's absolutely. 
It is absolutely important. And it's also very important that we use experimental methods. And this is how we can truly isolate the impact of the training. But having said that, I don't want to um, understate the challenges associated with doing this. I mean, I've been thinking about bias and policing, you know, for 20 years. It's very difficult to measure bias policing. And so in social science, we can't measure everything thing we want to measure. If you think about it, we don't even measure crime very well. We've got reported crime, we do have the NCPS, but we can't measure everything we want to measure. So I absolutely, as a social scientist, support increased um, evaluations, experimental evaluations. But in doing so, we also have to recognize the constraints. Because even the NYPD, that was a you know great laboratory and great researchers, but even they said, you know, trying to find the impact of implicit bias training on the streets it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So yes, but with an understanding of the challenges associated with that research. Great, thank you for that. So what are your thoughts on the impact um, that explicit policies and ordinances forbidding racist and implicit bias behaviors in a police department or law enforcement organization would have on reducing or eradicating poor and dangerous law enforcement practices? Well, okay, I hope I understand that question. All right, so forbidding bias behavior. I'm certainly in support of a, a chief and sheriff coming out and saying we do not um, allow that type of behavior. Um, and then certainly a portion of poor and dangerous policing can be linked to bias. Some of it's just linked to bad policing with egalitarian um, imposition across various groups. But I do think, I mean, um, that the that a, a portion of poor and dangerous policing is in fact um has a bias component i i you know when i think about who is on the receiving end of bad policing it's not the dominant groups i mean i'm not going to be on the receiving end of poor policing i you know drive a nice car i try to look nice and so you know i look like i might have the number of the mayor in my pocket so i'm not going to be on the receiving end of poor and dangerous policing it's more likely to be marginalized groups those that the police perceive the bad police i should say the bad police perceive that are don't have the power to challenge and and who is that those are the same groups we've just been talking about right it, it is um low ses it's it's individuals of color in low-income neighborhoods and lgbtq so there certainly is an overlap between bad policing and and biased policing and it interacts with power thank you Lori, for that so how often should ibt take place to be most effective? Say that again. How often should the training take place to be effective? Oh, how often? All right. So ideally, booster training would be 12 to 18 months after basic training. Um, but I know that resources can impact how often you can do it. But the other thing we talk about in the command level training is how can you reinforce those messages within the police department during the interim? They shouldn't just be hearing about implicit bias, you know, um, month one and month 18. There should be ongoing communications. Maybe that's the chief reinforcing the messages in when he, when he or she goes to roll call. I've had agencies send me their policy. I had an agency send me a policy. They were implementing a proactive vehicle stop program, and they asked me to put language in the policy that says, and while you're doing this, don't forget, don't let demographics impact on your decisions. Um, I would love if supervisors during their roll call training would pose hypotheticals, you know, what would bias look like in this particular situation? So 12 months, 18 months formal training, but ongoing messages in between is the way to keep these priorities and these um, messages front and center. Great, thank you for that. So the next one is uh, regarding when you were describing legitimate causes of racial disparities, such as in the case of stops. The person who's posed this question's understanding is that there are many causes of disparities other than implicit bias, and that many of these causes are based in structural inequality. 
in that way, is that a legitimate cause of racial disparity in policing? Okay. Oh, wow. That's deep. Okay. All right. So absolutely, there are structural inequalities. You know, one thing that comes to mind, and I hope this is responsive, is that, you know, people who are at higher risk of a vehicle stop are going to be those where there's more police activity. And we can assume, and maybe in a police department, the activity is based on calls for service. And so officers are in that area more often because there's greater crime. And those people in that area are more at risk of a vehicle stop. Well, you know, what put that, those people in that area and why is there higher crime? And that is related to all kinds of issues in our society um, that uh, impact the structural inequality that's inherent that put people in these neighborhoods. And indeed, it's in those neighborhoods, the people without opportunities, without educational opportunities, and that is where we find more crime. Um, so I don't know if this is responsive, but I absolutely am, am, am I love the question because again, a lot of what's going on is in fact structural inequality. I guess it boils down though to is, um, it depends on what we're doing with those data. If we're using those data to, you know, hit the police department over the head, we don't want to blame them for all the structural inequalities. inequalities. We want to make sure that they are accountable for the behaviors of their officers in those areas. And I hope that was responsive. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for that. So how would you or could you integrate um, implicit bias training with community members who are involved in building trust between the police and community? Oh, I love that. All right. So a couple of things. So um, our command level training is a day and a half because the leaders in an agency have the most to learn. Um, maximum 30 in the class. Our most popular version and our most effective version is when those 30 seats are shared by the leadership of the agency, sometimes multiple agencies if it's small departments, but the leadership of the agency and the other seats are filled with concerned community members. Maybe they represent LGBTQ, homeless, African American, teenagers, whatever it is, but these are the people in the room who are known for holding the police to account um, respected in the community as ambassadors, but able to come to the table for a constructive discussion. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for these groups to be together in the room. Um, these two groups, if you will, and I shouldn't be so simple, but these two groups often just speak at each other through the media. This puts them in the same room and perspectives are shared and learning occurs both ways. Sometimes it's passionate, sometimes it is passionate, but this is a passion producing issue. And so it's important for the police to hear the community. It's important for the community to hear the police. What are they doing? You know, what are the challenges they face? What are they already doing to promote fair and impartial policing? And then these community ambassadors need to understand the comprehensive program to produce fair and impartial policing for two reasons. One, they can help if they know what the leader is supposed to be doing, and they can hold the agency to account. I mean, many people in the community can only think of, okay, well, what do we do to address bias policing? Well, let's implement vehicles not data collection. And they don't think about leadership, supervision, accountability, and so forth. So that is a way to bring the community in. The other thing we've done, because that's reduced to only 30, we've also developed by popular demand an evening training that's just for community members that maybe didn't fit into the 30, um, which says to them, you know, we want to talk to you this evening about implicit bias, how it might manifest in police, how it might manifest in community members, um, what any individual can do to reduce and manage their biases. And we also tell them, and here's what your agency is doing to promote fair and impartial policing. So absolutely having the community involved is very important. Thank you. And I think that probably spoke to a lot of people on the, the um, webinar today joining us. So one of our attendees has asked a question about, is this a chicken or the egg? Is it a chicken or egg scenario? Is episodic bias feeding into systemic racism or is systemic racism being fed by episodic implicit bias? 
<laughs> and we talk in social science about reciprocal uh, relationships where actually there can be simultaneously impact. So episodic bias could produce systematic um racism and it, it works in the other direction too so i would say that it is reciprocal thank you the next question we have is do you believe that early warning systems can assist with identifying bias-based policing behaviors if so what factors should be used to measure this all right i i there are some challenges associated with using the early warning systems um, for the purposes of identifying bias. Um, a, some systems actually have some of their um, vehicle stop data. And in fact, you might look at that and other types of activities. And if you have the data regarding the demographics, that, that could be um, um, helpful. But as I mentioned before, it's very difficult to interpret that in a meaningful way. Um, I'd rather have supervisors using what they see on the scene. I want them using what they read in reports, what they hear in the locker room. I think that that can actually be more valid and reliable input for those supervisors that are trying to identify bias and bias-free behavior. So I'm not sure that I can think of any particular elements in the early warning system that pop into my head that would be an indicator of, of bias. So. I'm a big fan of early warning systems. I think they might be limited in terms of trying to help identify bias behavior on the part of law enforcement. I'd love to hear different points of view if they exist. Thank you. And, and next we have a question about, um, actually about um, information in one of your books. So in one of your books, you describe two different approaches when police get a call that may be a bias by proxy call. Uh, such as uh, view the alleged conduct from a distance versus approaching the subject and explain why officer was called to the scene. Do you have an opinion about which approach um, is most effective and any studies on this topic and those approaches being viewing the alleged conduct from a distance versus approaching the subject and explaining why the officer was called to the scene? I'm a little bit confused. Um, is that my book? So it's a bias by proxy. Um, I'd hate to ask you to restate it. Do you want to put it in your own words as you understand it, Cami? Well, so I think the person is talking about when there is a bias by proxy and, and actually um, for... for a pro Profiling by proxy. Yes. And so, th and they approach the situation and they have the option to either view the alleged conduct from a a distance and then approach or approaching the subject and and just explaining why the officer is on the scene oh oh okay got it got it got it got it got it all right so we do an exercise in all versions of our training from patrol to command and the scenario is there's a little old white woman in an all white neighborhood who calls the police um, to report a suspicious person out front and the only thing that is suspicious is that it is a person of color and she doesn't identify any particular um, any behaviors that are linked to criminal activity. So we pose that in our classes. What do you do? You know, what are the various options you have and what are the pros and cons of each? Um, and so people and, the, and this is very good with the, the command community in the same room. So, for instance, um, some police, particularly on the East Coast, will you know adamantly swear that you go to the car door of the man and you explain the old what the woman said. On the West Coast, they're more inclined to um, educate the woman, um, maybe not make an approach or drive by and collect information. And let me say this though: at the end of the exercise, we don't stand up there and say, "And we're going to tell you the right answer." This is an incredibly difficult situation for law enforcement. What do you do in these particular situations? We talk about the pros and cons because there's not a win-win in this situation. So if in fact the question is, do I think one's better than the other? I think that there are pros and cons to all of the various responses. Great, thank you for that. The next question we have is what do you say um, or, or how do you respond to those who think that funding for implicit bias training and other training is just adding more fuel to the fire by increasing funding for police departments that could otherwise go to community programs to reduce disparities? 
Okay, and so I think this really gets to the heart of the defunding. And as a criminologist, I was really glad that we at least had this conversation and are having this conversation because it's really asking us to explore from the ground up how to produce uh, public safety. And certainly producing public safety um, can be a lot more than police and should be a lot more police. And most of the chiefs and sheriffs will tell you the same thing. We put so many things on their doorstep. Um, when we deinstitutionalize people with mental illness, went to the doorstep of the police, can we do something different? Um, intoxication calls. So I absolutely believe this is a very valuable conversation. I think the chiefs and the sheriffs would, would welcome having some of societal's ills taken off their plate. What we can't do is defund the police before we have come up with these alternative ways in order to address the these social problems. That would produce a, a double deficit and only hurt the people, vulnerable people, and they you know, marginalize the communities. So absolutely, it's a healthy discussion. Absolutely, let's think about how we can take some populations, some problems off the plate of police and maybe put them into the hands of other types of professionals, but don't defund the police before those programs are in place. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Is there, so I think we do have some time for some additional questions. Um, we'll try to get through a few more. So is there a measure that triggers when implicit bias is actually more of an example of explicit bias, such as when there's an established pattern and practice of an officer's actions that appears to be implicit bias on its face, but overall might be an identifier for explicit bias? All right, and that is such a good question. And it can be very difficult to look at an officer over time in a particular incident and determine, it can be difficult to determine whether it's explicit or implicit bias. And even a pattern of behavior, that doesn't necessarily mean explicit. A person might have a pattern of behavior because they associate people of color with crime and it's implicit, they're not doing it intentionally. So patterns don't necessarily tell us whether it's explicit or implicit. But we would have to be able to read minds, you know, in order to look at any particular incident. First of all, it's difficult to look at an incident and to know whether it's biased policing. I mean, we talk about this with the supervisors. You might have two officers that just engaged in the same behavior. They each pulled over a black man in a car and one's practicing bias policing and the other one is not, depending on the motivations in their head. So it is very difficult to identify when bias occurs and it can be difficult in some situations to identify whether it's explicit or it is implicit. It's a great question. Thank you for that. The next question I have is, do you think implicit bias towards officers as a, well, implicit or explicit bias towards officers as a category on the part of communities with his, historical um, negative interactions with police creates differential outcomes? If so, what might, uh, the remedies be when less, hold on a second, I think there's a word missing here. If so, what might the remedies be when less police contact is the desire of many communities and traditional community oriented policing may be resisted? There's okay, I'm not sure I'm gonna get to all that because that was kind of complicated. But, uh, but I love the mention of the fact that community members have biases about police. And in fact, early on, I mentioned that one way we categorize people is by profession. And I would say that law enforcement officers are probably one of the most stereotyped professions I can think of. And indeed, it does impact um, on how community members, particularly from communities that have had challenged relationships with police and how they see a police officer. Um, and does it impact on the interaction? I would say yes, because you know one of the factors that's going to impact on an, an encounter is going to be a person's 
demeanor, you know, for good or for ill, that's one of the primary factors that impacts on um, police encounters. Um, and so I can picture this. So let's say we've got a, you know, an officer who knows in this community that they have less legitimacy. Maybe that officer arrives to a particular scene a little bit more authoritative in anticipating um, that type of lack of deference and the community member comes in with that lack of deference. This is a spiral downward for both of them um, in bringing their, their biases to the fore. So, you know, this is incredibly difficult, but this does go back to community policing. It does go back to um, positive interactions between community members and police, all the programs that police departments have in place, whether it's shop with a cop, coffee with a cop, um, you know, ice cream trucks, or even those that are a little bit more involved. And they work both ways. Because on the one hand, you can think of these programs, having the cops play basketball with the kids is reducing the biases that the officers might have about the kids, but it works both ways. Because presumably, if the officer is having a positive experience with LGBTQ, teenagers, homeless, presumably they're also having a positive experience with the cops, and maybe that's reducing the biases and the stereotypes about the cops. So the positive interaction, I think, is key. Thank you. So what is the science, if there is um, science, on the interaction of implicit bias and the choices on the use of force? Okay, so that's interesting. There's actually mixed research. Um, so there has been some research in the laboratory looking at shoot, don't shoot decisions. And so this can be, uh, for instance, you know, you're looking at a screen and a picture is going to pop up and it's a black male or a white male and he's either holding a gun or a Coke and you have to respond very quickly and you can do shoot and no shoot. And this has been done with community members as well as with police officers. And um, what we have found um, is, well, there's various measures too, which is important. They look at the speed of the decision making as well as whether the correct decision is made. Do you shoot the person with the gun and don't shoot the person with the Coke can? And what we have found in the laboratory research um, by the Corel team is that um, the implicit biases impact both the officers and the community members in terms of the speed at which the decision is being made. And so when it is a black male with a Coke can or a um, white male with a gun, the decision is slower and that reflects in a complicated way the uh, manifestation of implicit biases. But the Corel team also found that ultimately if you looked at errors, police were more likely to get it right. So that's good. And then we have a series of studies out of Washington, and this is Lois Jane, and she put officers through shoot, don't shoot scenarios, unfolding scenarios. And her results indicated that the officers actually were less likely to be overvigilant, were not overvigilant with um, black subjects. And Lois and I wrote an article together in the police chief, you know, what do we make of all this various research and what do we make of her findings? Well, her findings could be reflecting the hesitation that some officers are implementing um, when they're facing a, an encounter when they need to move quickly because they don't want to be on the front page of you know, USA Today. They don't want to be the headline in CBS News. And so sometimes officers might be, in fact, holding back when they're in a situation involving maybe a young black man, possibly to the officer's peril, because they are concerned about the backlash from society. So it is it is a, a mixed research, it's a complicated research, um, and both outcomes are bad, right? Implicit biases that might produce overvigilance with certain groups and, and concern about society's reaction, which might produce undervigilant and uh, potential harm on the part of officers. I hope I didn't make that too complicated. It is a complicated area. Uh, no, no, I appreciate that answer. So uh, the next question is kind of a combination of a couple questions that, or several questions that we're getting that are somewhat similar. Is there a uni universally, universally accepted way to determine if implicit bias in a police officer actually manifested itself in an enforcement situation? No, 
you know, I, I get calls from lawyers, you know, I want me to be an expert witness and comment on whether or not, you know, bias impacted this officer. Unless we get the technology where we can read minds, this is incredibly difficult. Now, um, if there might be a situation, you missed that specifically said implicit bias, we might be able to have clues of bias overall, like language in an encounter. But um, trying to figure out whether or not an officer pulled over these four black males in a car um, because he was concerned about the traffic violation or because they were black males is incredibly difficult. If not impossible. Thank you for that. Um, the next question I have is, is it a, real ex a realistic expectation that a comprehensive strategy, as you shared, can be produced and implemented in a one calendar year? Oh, that's interesting. Well, first of all, when you heard me go through the elements of the comprehensive strategy, when I go into an agency, one of the things we recognize is most agencies, particularly if they're bringing us in, are not starting from scratch. You know, they've been working on hiring diversity. They're screening at the hiring stage for explicit prejudices. They're doing vehicle stop data collection. So it all depends on the starting point of the agency. If I come in and they're, you know, 60% the way there, then in fact, they could implement um, everything else within a year. Um, but then of course it has to be ongoing. And of course, it's, it's, it's not gonna make a perfect agency. As long as we're hiring humans to do policing, we're gonna have imperfection. But whether or not they can implement in a year depends on where they're starting. Thank you. So I think that um, as we wrap things up, I think this is a great question to kind of pull everything together. So how would you suggest civilian oversight and police or law enforcement in general work together to reduce implicit bias between their sometimes different perspectives. And one of the things that that might be is actually um, having a session where both are in the room, um, where the civilian oversight and the you know representatives of the law enforcement are in the room talking about maybe some of the biases and the stereotypes that they have, that they have about police, they have about each other and so forth. When, when I was um, in, a, in a particular city um, afterwards, a group of cops in a particular neighborhood sat down with some of the kids in the neighborhood and they actually facilitated a really interesting and valuable discussion. What are the biases that the cops have, maybe about kids in that neighborhood and vice versa. So that's what comes to mind um, if you're talking about the biases that they might have about individuals on the quote, other side, sitting down and actually talking about them. Wonderful. Well, Lori, with that, I just want to thank you again for joining us today. Um, I really want to extend my appreciation to you um, I, and also to you, Lieutenant Hill, uh, for putting this together. I think um, the, the audience that has joined us um, I, has really benefited from your information and your perspective on this topic. So thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. So that I, I want to let you all know that our next event in the webinar series will be on February 7th where our panelists will be discussing police commissions as a method to achieve accountability. Um, please save the date and watch for additional information to come into your inboxes. And again, Dr. Fridell, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a pleasure to have you back with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time.